Art has been a mystery and a joy for millions since the beginning of man. Is art meaningful to you, or is it a strange and distant part of our culture? Then let art historian Richard Love and his guests make art come alive by exploring every avenue of the American art community. Love focuses on its makers and shakers, its traditions and its innovations. You may not always agree, but you will like what you see on American Art Forum. Now here's Richard Love. American artists seeking an unspoiled landscape and quietude settled in New Mexico in the first quarter of the 20th century and they established some art colonies there. Despite this isolation from New York and other eastern urban centers, some progressive artists contributed to and remained in contact with mainstream American modernism. The New Mexico Transcendental Painting Group was a, a small but a very serious band of artists whose contributions to modern American art is all too little known. I can't figure it out, but we're going to get to the bottom of it today. So, to tell you something about them, they were active between 1938 and 1941, uh, a short time, but, but a very important time to the history of American art. This Transcendental Painters Group were fairly unified in their quest for abstraction and non-objectivity. Uh, they painted beyond the paint surface. In, in essence, uh, they were bringing abstraction to a point beyond its material equivalent through a, an overt transcendental mode. My guest this week is Bill Lumpkins, one of the Transcendental Painting Group, which began nearly a half century ago. Bill, welcome to American Art Forum. Thank you. It's Richard. good. It's good. To it's have. good to be here. Yeah. Uh, one of the good things about it is that we're going to get to talk about a group that, as I mentioned in this little introduction, just isn't known. Why do you think um, they're not known? Is it because of your distance from New York? I think distance from New York. I think the fact that we were emerging just as the world was uh, dropping into chaos, the World War Two. And, and whether, okay. I'm, I'm sorry for interrupting, I don't want to. Yeah, it sort of broke us apart. Yeah, and, and, and whether it was in New Mexico or in New York or, or even Europe, abstraction just wasn't taken kindly to by, by dealers and critics. <laughs> no, we couldn't get in any, any major show. If you submitted your work, you, were, you knew you were going to get rejected. Well, why were you guys so bound and determined to paint abstract in an abstract way you were basically interested in creating uh, experimental and 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 uh, you were looking toward the future you were saying we're avant-garde what we know we are and we want to paint this way I think all of us really knew where we were going we uh, really felt very strongly about the abstract approach non-objective approach and we were just determined to do it, whether the world wanted to look at us or not. So there is truly idealism in art. But you know what I want to do? I want to talk about the 11 members. I just want to mention them. And then we're no. going to look at their work. Um, there was uh, Emil Bistrom, Ed Garman, Robert Grebrick, Lauren Harris, Raymond J uh, Johnson, William Lumpkins, you, Florence Miller Pierce, right. uh, the wife of uh, a, a man oh. by the name of Pierce, we'll get to that. Agnes Pelton, Howard Towner Pierce, uh, Florence's uh, husband. Dane Rudar, who was not only a painter, but a musician. A musician. Mm -hmm. And Stuart Walker, your close friend. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the, all of these people made up this group who devoted themselves to abstraction from 1938 to 41. That's when the group worked together. That's correct. But more than abstraction, they called themselves transcendentalists Mean, in art. Meaning to go beyond, to transcend the reality now, of art. Now, to transcend the traditional in art meant to go beyond ordinary subject matter, which we find in nature. Correct. So by abstracting, we're bringing a certain quality pictorially beyond what one would expect to find in walking in the woods or down uh, an alley or whatever. So in that regard, since it did not relate to what people saw in everyday nature, it was transcendental. That, that's, that's correct. It that's, in a nutshell, isn't it? Yes. Uh, we had no relation to the old transcendental religious movement or... The well, other well, what things. about that, though? Weren't there some of the 
some of the people who were pretty interested in, yes, in Hegel Bistrom. and and Jung and Freud yes, and particularly Bistrom was. Bistrom was also fascinated with Kandinsky, wasn't Kandinsky he? Kandinsky was really his god in many ways. Is that right? Did he um, devour the book concerning uh, oh, the spiritual yes. and art? So the spiritual and art was always <laughs> right at his elbow, practically. And that was good. He, he brought it, that thing to the West. And how about to you fellows, you, you, you uh, the, the women and the men who were working together, uh, did he try to influence you that way, or did he pretty much work alone? Business? No, we all left each other to go our own way. Because you have to remember, by the time I had met him, I'd been painting uh, these abstractions, uh, which you've seen today, and, yes. uh, for five or six years. Now, now, let's set everyone, let's set our viewers yeah. straight now. We're, when you say you've been doing it for five years, you began when? In the early 30s? 19, some of the, there's uh, dates in the new show for next fall at the university uh, dated 1930. 1930, you started that. Yeah. What got you going in 1930? I mean, that's pretty, pretty early in America for someone, especially in New Mexico or anywhere else, to be working in abstraction. Well, in 1930, I'm sure of the date, 1930, Lauren, uh, <clears throat> oh, a friend of mine. Anyway, he had a Another group. friend, another Yeah, artist. another friend, artist had a group of Marons. John uh, Marons. John Marons. Watercolors. Uh, which uh, John had been in New Mexico the year before and had done those marvelous New Mexico things. Yeah, sure. And uh, I walked into Lauren's uh, little hut there in Taos. Was it a kind of a studio? Is yeah, what, a studio. Yeah. In Taos, yeah. And he had these, I don't know why, upside down against the wall on the floor. The Marons. The Marons. Yeah. And I began to look at them and I thought, well, I, I'm feeling that. I, that's what I think. Is that right? And then I realized you turn them up or... Then there was subject matter. Then there was subject matter. But I realized you didn't have to have a subject to create a painting. It, to, to create something pictorially exciting. That's right. Yeah. Now, when you turn them upside down, when you think of Marin, you're thinking of these wonderful intersecting planes yeah. and these translucent passages, if, if, if indeed they were in watercolor yeah. and probably they were. Watercolor. They were. And, and so we're seeing a, a kind of a fragmented uh, system of spatial relationships. Now, were, were you working with that kind of geometric approximation of nature at, uh, on your own before that? Yes, to a degree, because my first reaction, well, uh, these are like some things I did last summer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Except when you turn them, uh, and I, th I think everyone should turn a mirror upside down. Well, down yeah, down. why <laughs> not? If you get that kind of inspiration, turn one upside down. What the heck? You know, it kind of reminds me of some of the lessons that were going that was going on in in French in France with some of the French artists, uh, Leger and others who looked at Matisse, you know, any time, you know, in the first part of the century. But here, you in the Southwest are influenced by somebody as sophisticated as John Marin with his works upside down. That's a heck of a way to come to it, but by <laughs> but golly, it if works. it works, <laughs> who cares? Who <laughs> can argue with yeah, it? Yeah, <laughs> I think that's great. Speaking of the kind of work that you were doing in the 30s, you know what we've got here, and I'm going to turn around to this other camera. I have a work here dated 1948, and uh, I want to show it to our viewers. Uh, I have to apologize a little bit in that it's not... The fans, it's not framed up very well, but this came right out of your studio, and it's signed and dated 1948. And some of that same, those translucent passages there, um, and that confluence of the organic and still the geometric is still showing here uh, 18 years later. And I know your work from even later than this. Uh, and I know it, 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 it still hasn't stopped to this day, Bill. No. No, I found my niche. And and spent a lifetime doing spent it. Spent a lifetime doing it. Well, that's that's great. Okay. Well, I wanted them to see that. Uh, this is in my collection now. No longer does anybody <laughs> else get to have that. But anyway, let's talk about uh, something a little bit about the philosophy and the conception of the group. Now, it it was a transcendentalist group, but it was limited, not so much in conjunction with philosophy and that sort of thing, but simply 
by creating the, the unified or the mutual quality was abstraction. The, that was the only uh, glue that held us together. We were all going in our own way in the abstract world. And some of the pictures were shown at the, at the Guggenheim, weren't they, in 40? Yes, in 40, the Guggenheim, then in uh, San Francisco at the World Fire. That was kind of amusing. They put us in a separate room so we wouldn't contaminate the American <laughs> Did they seat. really? Did they really? No. They said, you guys don't belong in here with this, all this good no. art? Is that right? That's right. Did and they tell you it was so you No, it? but it was very obvious. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that sounds like something the French would do. I, I, I didn't know that was going on. Yeah, it was... How okay. many, the, the 11 of you, or the, the, were the I 10 of think, you then? I uh, think, no, see, uh, we didn't have a Gerbrook in that show, nor... Uh, oh, Graybrook, we're, we're, we're talking about Robert Graybrook, Robert who, Graybrook, who didn't stay with the group very long, no. did he? He went on to work for Walt Disney as an animator. Yes. But I'm, at this point, in 40, was he still pretty active? As he a, was active then, mm -hmm. and, uh, but for some reason he didn't have a something ready for the show. Mm -hmm. uh, D Rudyard did not show in that show, and uh, I guess the rest of us did. But they yeah. separated you, and then the pictures were supposed to go off to France, weren't they? Yes. What happened to the pictures? Well, we think maybe a German <laughs> platoon <laughs> captured them. <laughs> we're not quite sure. But we, they never made it to France. They, uh, they didn't get there, did they? They didn't get back. Ah, but they did make it, maybe? We think they did. Yeah. Well, that was in the peak of the war as far as yeah. uh, Europe was concerned. Just, uh, you know, prior to uh, uh, Hitler had already started his transfer division. Yeah, sure. And uh, so. So it, it, it didn't happen. You know what I want to I want to show our viewers uh, some of the work just to give them an idea. Let's start out with uh, Emil Bistrom. The work we're going to look at comes from the year we're talking about, 1940. Here it is on the screen now. Uh, this is called Upward, and uh, it's a detail, and here's the, uh, another detail of it. This is pretty typical of what Bistrom does, isn't it, in 1940? Yeah. These flat, uh, contiguous planes. Uh, no, here's the, uh, here's the detail. I'm sorry, I went just a bit too fast. Um, uh, of, uh, of, of his work where inter these intersecting planes seem to be floating in space, don't and they? And transparent, you see. You're seeing the space has transparent yeah. movements. Uh, and not yeah. only, and, and with the space, these linear divisions, too, help to kind yes. of guide you in a, yeah. in a quasi kind of per perspective. Yeah, with a stability thing. Yeah, uh, right. Static. Almost like axes. Huh. Yeah. Um, when he painted, uh, did you get to paint with him much, ever? No. I, I Are these glazes was. he's using? Uh, no. He was quite right. a technician, wasn't he? Yes, he's a beautiful technician, and his technique was very perfect. The blush strokes, the High key control, color. Yes, the control of the color on the canvas mm -hmm. was... He worked a lot, he mixed a lot of white with his pigment yes. and he always brought the key up and there were soft and modulated tones, weren't they? That's in right. In spite of the fact that they were these strong geometric shapes and forms. Yes. Yeah. Fascinating guy. Why don't we look at the next one, which is by Ed Garman. Um, kind of interested in Ed Garman. Uh, this picture is from 1942, just called Painting Number 296. Uh, what about Ed Garman? Uh, he's working here in a flatter, formal, more of a formalized uh, plane, which, I don't know, it, I'm sort of I'm sort of reminded of Mondrian and some other people here. I think Mondrian uh, greatly influenced Ed. Uh, Was he a thinker, Ed yes. Garman? Oh yes. Now the colors, uh, Ed would mix that yellow, and he would almost well he would mix it by exact measurements, mm -hmm. and he put that in a log. So. If, Twenty years later, he had to repair that yellow. He could go back. His is log books are marvelous. Right? Is that right? Did he keep? He not only kept a journal on his uh, pictures. Uh, then he also uh, kept uh, an actual uh, materials Material log book, and, and along with it. Yes. Well, so he was very concerned with the future. In other words, he thought 
but he was contributing something pretty important. Ed he? always thought he was going to remain as a part of art history. How long did he live? Oh, he's still alive. Oh, that's right, Ed. Still, uh, he's, he's one of the, the three. Sorry, I don't mean to get rid of Ed. He's no. one of the few existing members. There, there is you. Uh, you, you uh, are, are still painting. Um, Ed Garman is is alive and still painting. painting. And then Florence Pierce. Florence Pierce uh, still painting. Still painting. And as a matter of fact, being being pretty darned avant garde, isn't she? Oh yeah, They're working with plexiglass things. and things. Yeah. Like that. They're amazing things. So of the 11, uh, there were there are only you three left. That's right. Well, I'll tell you what, um, <laughs> on that note, since uh, we, can, we can make it a little happier when we come back, we're going to take a break. So we want you to stick around uh, with us to talk more about the Transcendentalist group uh, of painters uh, from New Mexico. We'll return in just a moment. We're back talking... Uh, uh, with Bill Lumpkin about the Transcendentalist group of painters uh, from New Mexico. Uh, basically, they worked in the late 30s and very early 40s, only about three years, and the group is a who's who of uh, early abstractionist. Only un you and perhaps to all too many other people don't realize of the importance of their contribution to the history of art. Admittedly separated from the New York modern art community, uh, they worked in virtual isolation. Although uh, their work was exhibited fairly regularly uh, in the important urban centers. And uh, since Bill Lumpkin is my guest, we want to make sure that I don't tell you all of that, but he does. So Bill, we want to talk more about the group. Were you pretty cohesive? How did you meet? How I, I mean, was it just one person coming in after another one and then you said, look, we're a group? Or how? No, Raymond first suggested. Raymond Johnson. Yes. And uh, I he was. Knew, I'm sorry for interrupting, yeah. but to set everything straight, he was in Albuquerque or no, Santa Fe. Santa Fe. He had the only paint supply place in Santa Fe, and I met him through trying to buy some watercolor. See, is that how a lot of the artists met? The fact that Raymond Johnson had this paint supply place? Yes. And he I, was a painter? And, I so, think so. Yeah. Because, you know, Santa Fe was, had 10,000 people at the sure, time. Sure, sure. And. Uh, we would talk, and at some point somebody said, well, if we're ever going to get uh, in any exhibit hall or museum, we've got to form a strong group with a strong statement. And uh, Raymond thinking about it, he knew Emil Bistrom, he knew Agnes Palton. All of uh, whom were painting in an abstract all way. All abstract. And I knew Stuart Walker from the year or two I lived in Albuquerque. And uh, so we sort of formed a group. Now, there were several of the people I asked who weren't quite into the abstract group, like Katie Wells and mm -hmm. some of those painters that were moving towards abstract but hadn't made the complete transition as mm -hmm. the group had. Right, right. And uh, we would, we never had really formal meetings. You didn't discuss the complexities of each one's no. composition. No, we never discussed have big arguments thing. about aesthetics or anything no. like that. We just let each of us paint. And we all respected what each, and we, you have to realize we were going in many different directions. Were you? You know. I mean, I, when you look now, there's a tremendous difference. Yes. And uh, we respected that. You realized it then, didn't you? Oh, yes, we realized it. I Did didn't you, want to paint like Johnson or Bistrom. No, no, you wanted to be individuals. Did you ask questions though a lot? Did you say, "Hey, now, what, what are you? How are you get? How are you getting that transparent passage there? Or how are you getting that fat pigment to, to work no, for you like that?" We never did. No. So it was just a group of people saying, "We're ab we're abstract painters, and we want to kind of cling together here." And we should be shown. Well, how come all the dealers didn't come knock your door down to to get your pictures? Well. New York was kind of a closed corporation at the time. What do you mean by that? There uh, were, there anything were west of the Hudson was... Was what? <laughs> you didn't exist. Is that right? You, you know, know, sometimes I think it might be still that way a little bit. But yeah. in any case, uh, the, the abstract painters working in New York uh, were getting limited exposure themselves, so you guys working uh, there in the Southwest got even less, didn't you? That's correct. Yeah. Now, we knew about the New York group. 
Balcom Green. And so you know some, about Charles Green, Shaw, and Balcom uh, Green, and John Farron, and people like right. that. Uh, but, and but, it was very interesting. You know, here was the counterpart of us happening. Yeah, in the West. Uh, but, but really, you didn't have much kind of, uh, there was no intercourse between you. I mean, there no. was not much no. talk and communication no. or letter writing, was there? No. Why don't we look at another slide, though? This is um, a work by uh, Robert Gribrick, Church Ranchos de Taos. Uh, it's an undated uh, picture. Uh, but here, uh, while it is form abstracted, we're still seeing uh, objective form, aren't we? Yes. And, uh, Do you think the Southwest and its starkness and its plain, raw simplicity, I know it affected your work, and we're going to see your work shortly, but did it affect many others besides you and Greybrick and Raymond was heavily. Raymond Johnson. And Stuart Walker. Was. So a three or four yeah. still clung to a bit of the, of the subject matter. Well, the, the form, you know, the light, everything is so different. It is, that. isn't it? Far different from what it was in, in the East. Why don't we look at Lauren Harris and, and, and look at, at, at that. Now, this first piece, um, just titled Abstraction, a wonderful combination of line and flat planes. Um, again, I, I see just a hint of certain geometric shapes derived from nature, do you think? Yes, uh, because he had been a realist painter now, up to the 30 period. Now, while Graybrick didn't stay long with the movement, Lauren Harris uh, stuck with it a while, didn't he? Yes, uh, up until the war when he was called back to Canada because of family interests. That now, he was the only Canadian Yes, member, he was the he? only Canadian. He's pretty well respected by Canadians today. Here we're looking at a detail, uh, and again we're seeing this soft, translucent passage. That was part of the idea, though, wasn't it? Uh, many, uh, or not many, but some of the uh, artists used airbrush, didn't they, to get yeah. this softened, hazy quality? Uh, particular Johnson at one period, but now uh, Lauren. I don't think I ever got to the airbrush. I, I never saw an airbrush. Mm -hmm. It was a very controlled painting. Mm. Let's look at Raymond Johnson's work, uh, Chromatic Contrast, number six. Uh, this is pretty much, he wasn't the leader of the group, but he was uh, perhaps the oldest member and the guy kind of spearheaded things. Yes, Isn't that true? A, and your close friend. He was, he was oh, yes. a good friend. Yes, I used to house that <laughs> Raymond's house. Along with Stuart Walker. Yeah. Why don't we look at your work quickly. The next slide. Uh, this is a 1941 piece, a bit earlier than the one we showed on camera, uh, called Harsel. Again, uh, deriving, I think, from, uh, uh, from the uh, Santa Fe uh, landscape, uh, isn't it? Yes, I, it has a lot of landscape form and color in it. Yeah. Let's look at Florence Miller Pierce, the wife of uh, the uh, Horace Towner Pierce, the artist who was interested in more than just painting, wasn't he? Yes, he was interested in animated film. But here, Florence uh, uh, Pierce is, um, this work is called Rising Red, and it, it dates from 1942, and she uh, is still working uh, and, and very active, as I mentioned oh, earlier. Yes. Yeah. Well, let's look at Agnes Pelton. We've not looked at her work. And um, in this picture, Wells of Jade, 1931. Wow, what an early picture and amazing, simplistic form. This is like something out of a dream world. Uh, she was. I, I always felt this going beyond out into a mystical world. Um, so was she uh, also, did she think that way too? Was yes. She, she was a she, very mystical person. And concerned her. with the m more pure aspects of what transcendental means in yes. the English language, I suppose. We have to look at Howard Towner Pierce. Let's take a look at, at that work. 1939. This is the husband of uh, Florence Miller Pierce. Uh, they fell in love uh, right uh, while they and were school. part of the movement, didn't they? Yes. Yeah. But again, a strong relation to what we might think of when we're thinking of transcendental, uh, whatever transcendental means in, in art. What a marvelous 
a marvelous sense of space and division. Uh, quickly, I want to show Dane Rudyard because we're running out of time. This is Dane Rudyard, and then let's look at Stuart Walker, your close friend. Dane Rudyard was also a musician we mentioned, but here's Stuart Walker, who lived only until 1940, yeah. and he, w he became ill from the First World War, didn't he? Correct. Do you know what, Bill? We're out of time. I'm going to have to say it's been great having you. Well, it's been guess. great talking to Thank you. Thank you. We need to do more of it. <laughs> yes. We hope you've enjoyed the program. Uh, my guest has been Bill Lumpkin. We're talking about transcendental art. We'll see you again next week. Tune in to American Art Forum. New topics, new guests. Till then, have a great week.